the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. I want to take you back for a minute this evening in order to begin to the year 1881. You will recall two weeks ago I discussed with you the importance of this year, particularly the assassination of Tsar Alexander II, and how in a way 1881 and the resulting change in the life of Russian Jewry brought about a, a complete transference of what was once one of the major answers to the question of Jewish identity in the modern world. It is possible before 1881 to identify the Haskalah movement as a way in which Jews might take their place in modern society. The Haskalah movement which said that a Jew ought to be a, a Jew by virtue of participation in contemporary culture, but that he should do so through the language of his people. That through the Hebrew language, which Jews knew and understood, they could come into contact with all that European culture had to offer. Now, that was a possible point of view as long as one could look with hope upon the status of the Jew in the society in which he lived. As long as it was possible to believe that the governments would accept the Jew, that his being educated in algebra and chemistry and world history would somehow make it possible for the community in which he lived to accept him, to give him voting rights, to give him an opportunity to be educated with other people. As long as it was possible to believe that if the Jew brought himself out of the ghetto, the outside world would help him, the Haskalah movement had a future. But when Tsar Alexander II was assassinated, and when the Russian government used this as an excuse to begin pogroms against the Jews, and then to issue rather vicious laws, the famous May Laws of 1882 against the Jews, it was no longer possible for the majority of the members of the Haskalah movement, those who still had had faith by 1881 in what Jews might be in Russia, it was no longer possible for them to hold this out as a dream. Their faith in Russia was shattered, and there was left open to them two alternatives, the one revolution and the other, the reassertion of Jewish national identity. The Haskalah movement, which was so closely linked to the Hebrew language by and large, there was a Yiddish Haskalah of which we shall not have time to speak. The Haskalah movement, which was so closely linked to the Hebrew language, had been close to the problems of Jewish nationalism from its very origin. But it has interpreted it largely in terms of a nationalism leading outward to the greater humanity. Now, when the greater humanity seemed to be turning its back upon the Jews, the Haskalah movement could find a source and a direction for itself in terms of Jewish nationalism. Jewish nationalism of the variety which we discussed last week, a Jewish nationalism which asserted the value and the significance and the importance of the Jewish people finding rights on its own. Auto-emancipation, the Jew emancipating himself, giving himself his rights, by recreating his national destiny, now came to be the means through which the Haskalah leaders interpreted Jewish life in modern times. I want to remind you of this because it represents the background of the man about whom we are going to speak this evening. We might speak of many men as a matter of fact. Perhaps the chief competitor might be Peretz Smolenskin. Smolenskin was one of the early leaders of the Haskalah movement, the publisher of uh, a journal in Hebrew in which the calls to Jews to rise and educate themselves and reach out for culture, in which the interests of, of Hebrew belles lettres in modern terms were held before the people. This was the great goal of the modern Jew, to be a man of culture. But Smolenskin was one of the early Jews to recognize the failure of this point of view as presenting a rationale for the Jewish future in the contemporary world. And he was one of those who led the way back to Jewish nationalism, to the reassertion not just of human rights for all mankind in which the Jew participated, but of the right of the Jew to be a Jew 
and through being a Jew, to participate in all humanity. But we shall not speak of Smolenskin because although his influence was felt and though his case is characteristic, perhaps the chief exemplar of the modern Hebraist, the enlightened Russian Jew, who becomes a Zionist, who begins to interpret what it means to be a Jew in terms of the theory of contemporary Zionism, is a man who most people know by a name not his own. They know him by the name Achad Ha'am. Achad Ha'am is a pseudonym, a writer's name, uh, which he chose simply because of the fact that he didn't want to dignify himself as one of the literati or the cognoscenti of the day. Apparently most writers had to put on such airs in order to be a Jewish writer and a contemporary Jewish writer that he felt that from his point of view it would be better if he gave himself a more limited and humble status, so he was simply Achad Ha'am. He was one of the Am, the plain, ordinary people. But he was anything but that. His real name was Asher Ginsberg. It's a little difficult to know when one writes about him as to whether to refer to Mr. Ha'am or Mr. Ginsberg. If you talk about Mr. Ginsberg, people don't know who you're talking about. And Mr. Ha'am, if you know Hebrew, seems like such a peculiar name to call him. He's a most unusual man. He was a man who was a stylist, as so many of the modern Hebrew writers were, only he was a better stylist than most of them, and one whose style affected uh, all of the rest of Hebrew literature. He was a thinker, as many of the writers of his day tried to be. But again, he was a better thinker. He was a man whose thought influenced not only his own time, but still as seminal down to our very own day. And he was typically well-educated in general culture, but for reasons as so many of his colleagues found, found it necessary to turn from the general culture in which he was finding himself, to turn within and to be a Jew. To be a Jew in a very unique and different sense, as we shall see. The story of his youth is a somewhat familiar one to all of you by this time, I am sure. That he was not just the typical child genius that so many other people claimed to be, but we have rather good records that he really was. I believe he was ordained at the age of 15 or 16 and could have had a future opening up for himself as a bright young scholar. He was married to the daughter of a rather wealthy merchant and lived in his father-in-law's home for many years, continuing his studies and developing. But by the time of his marriage, he was already interested in those Hebrew books which were speaking of anything but Jewish philosophy and Jewish law. He had already discovered the books which led to the general world. And while he never had the benefit of a university education, while he had to train himself, he had a rather rounded point of view on the general world. His views on literature, on world history, on the developing sociology, and particularly the folk psychology of the time. The whole racial theory and the national theory, which we shall see, influenced him rather strongly. These things in him give the evidence of an unusual mind, one which doesn't show the usual gaps and crags which are to be found in people who have had to educate themselves, but shows rather a mind which found it possible to round out, almost even to synthesize, the information it took in. He began to study the secular materials of his time and became a rather typical Haskala leader. Not that he wrote. I mean by that simply that his goals were the goals of the Haskala, to become an enlightened Jewish gentleman participating uh, in the world around him. But he always stayed out of things, rather than writing articles and frantic articles in the high romantic style of the day. He didn't write at all. He was concerned to participate only from a distance. And this was a characteristic of his entire life, a man who produced only four slim volumes of essays in an entire life as one of the major modern Jewish writers. He entered into letters only in passing. The pseudonym itself would be a kind of an indication of this. Achad Ha'am, one of the people decided to write a critical essay on the way Zionism is going in our day. And only after one of the editors who knew him, 
importuned him, practically cudgeled him into writing an essay, did they finally get this thing out of his hands. All his life this was to be his theory. He believed in quality over quantity. He believed in the highest possible standards. And even the way in which he wrote was indicative of this. He was a stylist, but a modern Hebrew stylist. He took his style from the European writers and particularly from the great Russian writers of his day. No longer the high-flown biblical style in which one uses biblical language and phrases in order to express common things which you couldn't quite find a way to express. No longer the dramatic high-flown sentence, the kind of romantic spilling all over the page. To the contrary, instead of following the biblical Hebrew as his model, he took Mishnaic Hebrew as the basis upon which he wrote. Now for those of you that have had no experience either with the biblical Hebrew or the Mishnaic Hebrew, one might compare it with the King James translation of the second Isaiah or of Job with these great sonorous rolling poetic passages reading almost like Milton um, or one of the great epic poets um, and the rather simple language of the revised standard version of the New Testament. Simple, down-to-earth, plain language. What he did with this Mishnaic Hebrew style of his was to free himself from anything that stood in the way of the logic. What concerned him was the idea. He wasn't trying to show how much Bible he knew or how cleverly he could utilize biblical phrases to say simply what he wanted to say. He wanted the logic to come through. And this was something new. This was a, a, a notion that modern Hebrew writing was to be governed by its content and not by its cultural background. The fact that Hebrew was the language of the Bible didn't mean that people had to be rewriting the Bible all the time. It meant that a language should be used to say what it had to say. And he started the modern Hebrew principle of using Hebrew as if it were really alive. And thus through him it tended to become alive. Not that he wasn't intelligent enough to know when to use the Bible or even a rabbinic comment. But when he used it, it was apt. You don't have the feeling it's an intrusion into the text. It's rather an aside and you say, oh, gee, he referred to the Bible, didn't he? By George, he's added something here by using this phrase in this particular way. He really wants you to remember that he knows that this is Isaiah or Jeremiah but it doesn't get in the way. This is a, a modern man using his Hebrew even from the very beginning. But it's quality and not quantity. It's logic and not rhetoric. And it's carefully worked out as to form the shape of the essay. The way in which it begins, goes along and ends has been carefully measured. Perhaps a, a Swiss watch may give you the wrong impression of what he has to say, but compared to the rather loose and flapping Jewish essays which we had before, this is a precision instrument. But he didn't mass manufacture them, and as we shall see, his objection to mass manufacture was one of the major motifs of his life. Because you must also understand that, except for one very brief period as the editor of Hashiloach, a Hebrew magazine, he was not a Jewish writer by profession. He was, if I may express pleasure at the matter, a Jewish businessman. He made a living, went to work, had his normal occupations. But his hobby, his interest, was Jewish thought and Jewish thinking and Jewish nationalism. His one hobby was chess wanted to play chess, loved to play chess. This was the one game he took up, nothing else. But because it interfered with his other hobby, Jewish nationalism, Zionism, the development of the movement as he thought it should be, he gave up chess and didn't play. This was his leisure time activity. Being a Jew, understanding what it meant to be a Jew, thinking about being a Jew, carrying on a voluminous correspondence, some of which has been gathered and published, and writing an occasional essay, thinking for months very often before writing an essay. This was his life. 
Reminds us a little bit of Moses Mendelssohn, you will recall, who was also not a Jewish thinker by profession. And somehow this goes to the very depths of what it has meant to be a Jew in the past. Judaism has not, in previous centuries, been confined to the professional Jew. The Jew has had to be paid in order to be a Jew. The Jew has had to be somehow kept in order to have enough time free to think about Jewish things and to do them. It's a little hard to know quite how men like Mendelssohn, and particularly men like Ahad Ha'am in our own time practically, have managed to carry this out. It's difficult at best. Even the Jewish professional hardly gets time to think. And I therefore say with great admiration how magnificent it is to have a tradition of men like Maimonides, who was a doctor, of Mendelssohn, who was a merchant, and of Ahad Ha'am, who in his last years worked for the famous Wasatsky Tea Firm and carried on its London branch. He was a businessman who carried on this literary activity, first in Russia and later in London, finally ending his life in uh, Tel Aviv, uh, as a critic. This was his major intellectual position. He tried from time to time to write positive essays. He tried to take his reactions against what was going on around him and to show the positive direction uh, in which they would go. And he had the dream of someday writing the book that would fully describe uh, his positive attitude towards Judaism. Interestingly enough, it was one of the reasons why he was willing to leave Russia and go to London. He dreamed of going to the British Museum, which is, of course, not so much a museum as a library, the world's probably greatest library, because he dreamed if he could ever be in a city like London, in which it would be possible for a man to go and get almost any book which exists in the world, that he could sit in the museum there and have the opportunity to get the books and to study and to write his magnum opus, which was to be a book of Jewish ethics, Jewish ethics, the ethical attitudes of the Jew. It's interesting, and I think perhaps that uh, you may find it somewhat, uh, what shall I say, uh, personally interesting to see what happened when he got to London. When he got to London, um, he lived as most normal Londoners did, out a little bit from the part of the city where he worked. So every day in order to get to work, he had to take the underground what you know is the subway. By the time you take the subway to work and take the subway or the bus back to the British Museum, he was so tired that he found it difficult to work. And unfortunately, the British Museum didn't have evening hours in those days. So as a result, on the occasions when it was open, there was some overlapping there, he couldn't even get in to begin with. So as a result, the years in London, which carried with them the promise of finally being able to write this book, didn't result in the book. And when he finally left the Wasatsky Tea Firm and went to Tel Aviv to live uh, in semi-retirement for the last few years, his health was by that time sufficiently ruined, perhaps by the subway, perhaps by the London weather, perhaps by the strains of life, perhaps simply by his rather frail uh, physical nature to begin with that he never did get a chance to write the famous book on Jewish ethics, uh, which he had hoped to do. What distinguishes him, however, is the fact that even though he never got to complete the master work, he etched out both in negative terms, as well as in certain positive indications, an attitude towards Judaism, which was an important counterfoil to that of Theodore Herzl and which became the basis of a, of a positive response to being Jewish in our own time, which still continues down to the present day. He is a real theoretician, a real philosopher of Jewish existence in our own day. One can only regret that he never had a chance to finish the work fully, but I think it will be possible for us to sketch in fairly clear terms exactly the position that he took. It will be easiest, I think, if we compare Ahad Ha'am with Theodore Herzl. The reason for that is that Herzl was the pivotal personality of Zionism in Ahad Ha'am's time. You will recall that one of the major contributions that Herzl made was to give the Jewish world a figure 
around which to circulate its dreams. Herzl's halo was almost more important than Herzl himself. Almost everyone was taken in by Herzl's magnetism, by the extraordinary personality of the man. Almost everyone, that is, but Achad Ha'am. And Achad Ha'am is important, therefore, as standing off on the sideline and saying to everyone in this precise, crisp, clear, logical Hebrew voice, the king is naked. The king is naked. This was his function. Perhaps if there had been no Herzl, Achad Ha'am might never have written. His major strength seems to have been in criticism. On the other hand, perhaps he would have finished the positive book which he began. But what brought him to the attention of the Jewish world was the fact that those who were seeking to clarify their areas of disagreement with Herzl found Achad Ha'am, the clarifying voice. When he voiced his criticisms, they understood what had been bothering them. He seemed to articulate the instinctive reactions of many Jews against Herzl, even when they went along with him. And as we shall see, it was Achad Ha'am's disciples who later took hold of the Zionist movement and carried it on after Herzl was gone. Now, in what ways did Achad Ha'am differ from Theodore Herzl? Well, if you will recall, Herzl's major interest was political. He wanted the Jewish people to become involved in negotiations with the great powers in order to make possible the establishment of some kind of a Jewish state. But the point of concentration was political. When someone objected that he spent so much time with uh, one of the Montefiores in England, uh, Weizmann, I believe, reports uh, uh, him uh, objecting to Herzl spending so much time with uh, one of the Montefiores. He, the man was an utter ass, says Weizmann. And Herzl looked at him with great dignity and said to him, why, he opens kingly doors for me. Whereupon Weizmann says he couldn't help breaking out into laughter that the thing was so pompous. But the fact remains, this was Herzl's approach. What he was interested in was getting in to see the king, any king as long as it became possible to negotiate. Now, it sounds as if I'm being satirical of Herzl, but remember what this did. It legitimized the Jewish quest for a Jewish state. It brought upon the agenda of international affairs the Jewish request for a Jewish state. Now, what was Achad Ha'am's approach? Achad Ha'am wasn't particularly interested in politics. As far as he was concerned, all the politics were rather a waste of time, unless one prepared for the Jewish state, not politically, but culturally. If the Jewish people, the, the, the masses of the Jews, even the, the growing edge of the Jews, even a small group, were not culturally ready to take up Jewish life as a nation, then what was the sense of having the whole thing? Or, to put it another way, Herzl was interested in one piece of paper. He wanted a charter. He wanted a contract which legitimized the Jewish right to go settle somewhere. Hopefully Palestine, but perhaps any place. He wanted that guarantee, that treaty. But Achad Ha'am? Achad Ham didn't want a, a, a charter, he didn't particularly care about it. What he would have settled for were a few pilot groups, pilot groups either in the diaspora or in Palestine, hopefully in both. Pilot groups whose concern it was to live up to the heights of Jewish nationalism. Whatever it was that the Jewish people had been and had carried on through the ages, whatever this Jewish people stood for, let a few people come back again to this kind of living. Because without it, what was the good of the whole state? And this, of course, was the, the major difference between the two. Herzl's Zionism was negative. It was a reaction to anti-Semitism. Just as the Dreyfus affair plays such a seminal role in Herzl's life, so with Achad Ha'am, one has to look not to the outside world, but to the inner Jewish life to understand what prompted him to become interested in Zionism. Herzl learned to be a Zionist by the way the non-Jew treated the Jew. Achad Ha'am learned to be a Zionist by the attitude that the Jew had toward himself.
Herzl was concerned to see to it that there was a place where Jews would no longer be troubled by anti-Semites. And as far as he was concerned, the people in the diaspora who couldn't assimilate should go to the state of Israel. If they couldn't go to the state of Israel, they should try to assimilate, but one or the other. In a way, in our own day, Kessler holds the same view. He says, there is a Jewish state. Either go to the Jewish state and be a Jew, or if you want to live in the diaspora, assimilate. But this is not Achar Ha'am's point of view. What is his attitude? His attitude is, how can this man Herzl write a book about Zionism? There isn't a word in it about Jewish history. There isn't a word in it about Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and return to the land. There isn't a word in it about the prayer book and the longing of the Jewish people. The man doesn't even know Yehuda Halevi ever existed. He has no concept of what the peoplehood of the Jewish group is, of what its of communal character is like. Doesn't even know the Hebrew language. Doesn't have a feeling that the Jews have been bound together through the ages by a, a desire to return to the land. That one of their strongest survival factors has been the fact that they were more than just an association of ideas. That they were a people with a real group, an ethnic identity. So as a result, he doesn't take the point of view that you either go to the state or you assimilate, because he doesn't start from the point of view that uh, Zionism begins with anti-Semitism. But starting from the point of view that Zionism begins because of the nature and character of the Jewish people, he says, what we want our Zionist home for is to live out to bring to birth once again, to fruition, to, to maturity, the spiritual will of the Jewish people. And if we can establish a center there where the Jewish people will finally be able to live in its own terms as a, as a virile, mature people, standing on its own two feet culturally and spiritually, then Jewish communities around the world will have a basis from which they can draw their own spiritual strength. They will be able to live in the diaspora by virtue of the fact that there will be one place in the world where what it means to be a Jew will be articulated, thought through, lived out, expressed. This is Ahad Ha'am's unique notion of the Jewish state as a spiritual center. And therefore his entire theory of Zionism is as positive as Herzl's was negative. You can imagine the way, therefore, in which he criticized everything that the Zionist organization did. Achad Ha'am's role was to stand there and say, you're carrying on political activity? For what? You're going to get Jews to the state? For what? They're not ready. You're going to bring in masses of ghetto-oriented Jews, people who haven't had a chance to live up to what it means to be a Jew in generations, people who are unaccustomed to a free state. For what? You're spending time and energy dealing with kings when individual Jews aren't even prepared to understand the background of their people, to build a, a culture. What, what's the whole point of the thing? if we're not really prepared. It's not the outer assurance, I mean, it's the inner preparation. And so he stood by and he criticized. He criticized the broad generalizations, the, the great and grandiose dreams, and called for specific, concrete, and immediate projects. He even finally founded a small Zionist organization of his own, although it went back somewhat in time, called the B'nai Moshe. The B'nai Moshe, which goes back uh, sometime before Herzl, was founded because he didn't think everybody should be allowed to be a Zionist. I mean, if ordinary people wanted to be Zionist, that was all right, but this wasn't really the kind of Zionist out of whom one really built the Jewish state. What you needed was, first of all, people who were willing to accept Zionism as a kind of a personal responsibility and duty. Because to be a real Zionist, you had to understand the spirit of the Jewish people. You had to understand Jewish culture. As a matter of fact, you couldn't even understand Jewish culture without helping it be reborn. You had to help make Jewish culture come to be. And, since as we shall see, what Jewish culture meant to him was something highly ethical, one had to be willing to live on the most ethical possible plane.
Notice the aristocracy involved here. Notice the aloofness of which we spoke before. Notice the refusal to, to mix and mingle in the dirty little problems, but rather the desire to do things small and beautifully. If the style is the man, as the French say, then here too the style is the man. His attitude towards politics seems to be the same as his attitude towards writing an essay, and even his attitude toward living his life. Now, for those of you who are somewhat more practical politicians, I should hasten to point out to you that while he was the first president of B'nai Moshe, it didn't last very long. He gave up the presidency, and the leadership of the group passed first to the uh, group in, um, I think it was Warsaw, I don't recall now, one of the European cities, and that went to a group that was located in uh, Palestine, but pretty soon the group disappeared. It couldn't live up to his standards. Even the chosen few couldn't make it. Now this man stood outside the Zionist movement and criticized the Zionist movement for terms that made sense to those that were within. He was a Zionist and he was a Hebraist, and he was a positive Jew, and they had to accept him as such, and yet at the same time to recognize that with all the, the mystique, the grandeur, the, the power, the messianism that was released by Herzl, something was missing. Achad Ha'am added the positive Jewish element to what was missing in Herzl's political Zionism. Now, in doing so, he defined the positive quality of what it meant to be a Jew in a way different from that which had been done before. And how did he do that? He said in the first place, it is not enough to say that we are Jews by virtue of anti-Semitism. Jean-Paul Sartre in our own time has said a Jew is a Jew because people hate him. It is the fact that there is anti-Semitism that makes a Jew a Jew. It is the outside world that identifies the Jew as a Jew. This is the point at which Achad Ha'am vigorously disagrees. He disagrees even though he refuses the normal positive basis for Jewish identification. If you have to find some ground from within, the normal ground is the religious ground. Revelation. God gave us the Torah. He made a covenant with our people. He chose us. Any of the terms you want. But Achad Ha'am rejects those terms. He is therefore doubly significant because he is one of the few theorists to try to give a characterization of the Jewish people in non-religious and yet spiritual terms. The word spiritual becomes a key word in Achad Ha'am and I shall try to get to it in a moment. He is a man who says that the religious identification and understanding of the Jewish people is not the correct one and yet one has to understand this people in a spiritual sense. He does that because he's a modern man, because he agrees with so many of the modern men that after all, how can a modern man be religious? I mean, if you study science and you study history and you study biology and you, you study the whole growth and evolution of cultures, you can't really accept the old supernatural religion. One has to instead work on the basis of the modern sociology and the studies of cultures of our time and see the Jews in this light as well then how does he come to understand what the Jews are? Well, basing himself on the science of his time, he utilizes the findings of the folk psychology. Well, he doesn't spend terribly much time about it. He makes the, the following assumption, or if I may put it in religious terms, he makes the following statement of faith. Every people has a normal and natural will to live. This people, in expressing that will to live and that will to survive, also expresses its unique and individual personality. That's what makes it what it is. It may be a combination of geography, of history, of chance occurrence, of a certain amount of, of genius, of leadership among the people. But it has a unique personality of its own. And as it wills to live, it expresses this personality. Now, the Jewish people, similarly, is a people like all other peoples with a will to live. And the Jewish people, like all other peoples, has a unique national soul. And the Jewish people, like all other peoples, has expressed that national soul through history. 
As a matter of fact, the Jewish people, because of the peculiar and unusual uh, history that it has, has developed itself and expressed its souls in rather an unusual way. Now, the people in expressing its national character expressed itself, among other ways, through religion. And during the period when it left its land, it used religion as a means for expressing its national will to live. There was no other institutional form to do so. They didn't have a land, didn't have a government, they didn't have a central authority. In order for the people to survive, therefore, it had to find something through which this national will to live could express itself. And so it seized the religion in which its people believed. And it invested all its national will to live, all its energy to survive in its religion. And it worked. The religion then enabled the people to survive. The religion became the means through which this people achieved its survival. Now today, when we are modern men and are no longer taken in by these notions of revelation, a supernatural God, and all this kind of thing, when we see the history of nations and their ways of developing through history, we are in a position to understand the true relationship. Our traditional religious point of view is wrong, he says. It is not religion which gave birth and kept this nation alive. To the contrary, it is the nation which has the will to live and which in the period after it had to leave its land used religion as a means of keeping itself as a nation alive. And therefore, what do we have to do in our own day? Well, the obvious thing to do is to strengthen the nation. Bring the nation back to life. Let the nation express itself once more as a nation, as a, as a people with a culture, with a full-scaled culture. If some people want to be religious that's, religious, that's up to them, sure. They can be religious. But for those of us who are modern and understand that religion has nothing any longer to say to contemporary man, we can leave the religious part aside and simply express ourselves through the natural cultural forms of what it means to be a Jew. Thus, the primary positive goal of modern Jewish life is the reestablishment of national health, of building allegiance to the Jewish people in such a way that people who are part of it will want to live as a Jew, to express themselves as a Jew. And then out of this, all the rest will come. Thus, if you want to talk about Zionism, even Zionism, the will to exist as a people, has to first be based upon getting the people to understand what the Jewish nation is and to want to be part of the Jewish nation and to participate in the Jewish nation. And when the health of the Jewish nation is established, then it will be possible to have a Jewish state and to have people live as Jews, and then a Jewish state will make a certain amount of sense. But what is intriguing about Ahad Ha'am is what he considers to be peculiarly Jewish. After all, what is it that makes the Jewish people unique? What is their unique soul, their individual character, which has been expressed through the ages? It is, he says, nothing less than ethical passion. The Jewish people are a prophetic people. Their leadership in ancient centuries was set by the prophets. The men who took an absolute stand on issues of right and wrong and justice. And this sense of morality has troubled and bothered and beset the Jews as a nation and as a people all through their history. This is the genius of the Jewish group, namely, that they are a prophetic people that the spirit which they have within them expresses itself in terms of a universal ethic. But this universal ethics which the Jewish people have, which would be applicable to all people, which is what the word universal means, which makes sense to everybody anywhere, this universal ethics is now part of the people. It is built into the people and it is their genius to find ever new ways to express it and make it clear.
Now I hope you understand that by saying this, he therefore meant to apply that other peoples don't have this ethics. And he had no hesitation whatsoever in making comparisons to Christianity and Christian ethics. And one of the things that he enjoyed doing was contrasting Jewish ethics as he saw them and Christian ethics as he saw them and showing how one was positive, righteous, absolute, moving forward with strength and energy to shape and direct the world, and how the other, as he understood it in terms of its ethic of love, was rather passive and soft and formless and shapeless, and how almost anything could happen under it, and how the world, as we understand it, could probably not really survive under it. He was a rather sharp and severe critic of Christianity. And since there was nothing else in the world to compare to Jewish ethics, this indicated for him that the Jewish ethical character was a character which still needed to be carried out and lived out and expressed in the world around him. And this was why the most important thing that he wanted to do with his life was to write a book explaining what Jewish ethics were. To really write down in some detail and work out the interrelationships of all the ideas which would express this Jewish national character. And this is why, although we have some wonderful essays by him, we miss this major Jewish work. It's quite clear that he's speaking in terms of uh, ideas of his time, ideas which are strongly influenced by Kant and in a way too by Hegel, as well as by the developing sociology and and the positive attitudes towards society of his time. But it's a shame that, that we've missed it. He even goes a step further with this. He adds a kind of missionary fervor to it. He says that the Jewish attitude, no, that's the wrong word, the Jewish responsibility with regard to this national character is to carry this to all the peoples of the world. The Jews have a mission in history to see to it that this universal ethical point of view is finally clarified for all mankind. That this universal ethics, which any really right-thinking man would come to recognize, finally becomes the possession of all peoples. It's interesting, therefore, what he means by spiritual. By spiritual, he means that German faculty, which is so difficult to translate, which we know as Geist. Geist is not just spirit in some kind of a mystical religious sense. It is spiritual in the sense of the highest intellectual and emotional, aesthetic, and ethical sensibilities. It is the fullest expression of man as man, but doesn't necessarily imply any religious characteristics. And because he stressed this spiritual part, this fulfillment of man on this level, because he stressed it so much, it's interesting that his contemporaries found him a little hard to take. The ones who were modern felt that he was being almost religious, a little too spiritual, not materialistic enough in the good modern sense of getting down to realities, of dealing with man as man, of dealing with politics as politics, of dealing with society as society. This is too philosophical. And it's interesting how in his own way, he is not only a critic of the reformed Jews, because obviously the reformed Jews who are trying to assimilate to the society around them and yet remain religiously Jewish are giving up to him what is critical. With all his criticism of the Western Jews and particularly the reformed Jews, what he seems not to realize is that he is a reformed Jew turned inside out. He has adopted almost the same kind of language and phraseology and ideas, only on a secular level rather than a religious level. Where they say one is a Jew by religion, he says no, one is a Jew by being a member of the people. But the people has a mission and the mission is primarily ethical. They too say that a Jew is a member, but a member of a religion which has a mission which is primarily ethical.
The spiritual quality in the one case is put into a religious key. In the other case, it's put into a nationalistic, a sociological key. But they are exactly the same. In each case, one has given up a significant part of what it means to be a part of the Jewish people. The Reformed Jews have given up the peoplehood of Israel, still at this stage. And he, he has given up the religion of Israel as only an outer shell in which the people clothed itself. But his notion of what the Jews are and why they ought to continue is exactly the same as theirs. The mission of Israel, its ethical goal in history is the same both for the hated reformed Jews and for this most Jewish of Jews. It is no wonder then that in the recent volume The Zionist Idea by Sidney Hertzberg, which I think I have recommended to you before, Hertzberg calls Achad Ha'am the agnostic rabbi. A man who can't believe in God and leaving God aside, nonetheless takes over all the paraphernalia, puts it around the nation and comes out with a statement of faith and commitment, which sounds very similar to the religious point of view which we saw uh, in Germany. It is for this reason, too, that Achad Ha'am was not accepted widely uh, by all the people of his day. It isn't just the magnetism of Herzl. It's the fact that this kind of a nationalistic, religious, qualitative attitude is too much for most people. Most people simply cannot see that this is the Jewish people or that they need the Jewish people on this kind of level. For them, they are satisfied. People persecute us. We are Jews and we have our own rights and we are a people and we're ready to go ahead. But what the quality of the people is and quite at what ethical level it has to proceed, this is another question for them. To be sure, they are influenced by his positive, his positive emphasis on the character of the Jewish people. It is not just a state of Jews that we want. It is a Jewish state. It is not just a political association of Jews, possibly in Uganda, in Africa, as Herzl was willing to consider it, but it is a Jewish state, a state on the land of Israel, a state of Jews living as Jews. It is qualitatively a Jewish state. It is true that in this respect he was accepted. In this respect, he forms the counterfoil to Herzl, around which his disciples, primarily Usishkin and in part Weizmann, later take over the control of the Zionist movement. When Herzl dies, the idea of the Charter dies with him. No longer does the Zionist movement become the kind of movement which is concerned to get from someone a single document. To be sure, the political agitation is kept up. But now the emphasis is upon colonization, upon getting Jews to the land. And if it isn't as qualitatively desirable uh, as Achad Ha'am would like, if there isn't as much emphasis on Hebrew or upon the high ethical standards which should form the basis upon which a true Jew should live, nonetheless, it's Jewish existence coming to be in a Jewish way on a Jewish land. Now, from our point of view, what is interesting is the way in which Achad Ha'am has redefined what it means to be a Jew. He has contributed one important factor to the contemporary Zionist notion that still remains important and sets one of the critical problems down to our own day. And this is the problem. Is it sufficient for Jews to form a Jewish nation and let it go in any direction it wishes. Is it simply enough to bring them together and say, look, whatever comes out, comes out? Can the fact of having Jews living together in a given land, even the traditional land, be sufficient? Can it be sufficient without a positive interpretation of Jewish identity? is what makes the Jewish state Jewish the fact that the people who came there and formed the majority were born Jews? Or is it the way they live? Is it something about the character of their life together which makes them Jewish?
can Jewish existence in modern time be solved simply by all the Jews getting together and forming an international rather than a national ghetto. Take all the Jews out of the various country and put them in a national ghetto, in this case, Palestine. And by virtue of the fact that they're all there and they're all Jews, that's Jewish already. Or must there be a relationship to the Jewish past and to Jewish ideas producing some kind of a Jewish culture which carries on from what the Jews have been in the past. To be sure, he says, since his answer is positive to these questions, you must have all these things. While we don't want to do this religiously, we must nonetheless find a way to do it. We must somehow find a way in which to make the Jewish state Jewish, not just by the aggregate numbers of those who are present, but by the quality of what is involved. And I submit that this question posed by Afar Ha'am is still the major riddle with regard to the state of Israel. There is a whole debate and discussion going on in the state of Israel today as to whether or not the Jews of the state of Israel have really any relationship with diaspora Jewry. Not the diaspora Jewry who live in the United States today, but with their own grandfathers and great-grandfathers. Whether there's anything that they can learn from the ghetto, even from the medieval philosophers of the Talmud. Or do they really have to jump right back to the time of Joshua, or Saul and David? There was a group of uh, Jews some time ago who created quite a furor who wanted to be known as Canaanites. They were really going back to the Jewish roots before the Jews became contaminated by Moses and the revelation on Sinai. What is it that makes the Jewish state Jewish? The biological descent of the people who founded it? Or something else? If you say it's not religion, as the majority of Israelis at the moment say it is not religion, then what is it that makes it Jewish? It's a key question for the state of Israel. It's interesting that about a year or so ago, the Israeli government, becoming very conscious of the problem, decided that a new program would be introduced in all the schools. The Israeli government decided that a special emphasis had to be given to what it called the Toda'a Yehudit, Jewish consciousness. Jewish children growing up in Israel, speaking Hebrew, celebrating the Jewish holidays, knowing the Bible in the original language, knowing very often some understanding of the rabbinic literature and some understanding of modern Hebrew literature, or at least of what once was modern Hebrew literature, still missed something in terms of their consciousness as Jews. Now we may smile at it a little bit because it makes us feel good that, well, they don't have all the answers, you know, and maybe we really are Jews, and it goes to show you don't settle all the problems by going to Israel either. But it's Ahar Ha'am's question. What makes the Jewish state Jewish? Particularly when you say it can't be religious. Now he gave his answer, and the answer has by and large been rejected. Although Ben Gurion has a kind of messianism, as we shall see, which is not too far different from uh, Ahar Ha'am. And if the question holds for the Jews of the state of Israel, the same question is true of the Jews of the diaspora. Because the criticism which Ahad Ha'am made of the Jews of diaspora, namely that they were using every excuse to claim that they were Jews, but that they didn't really show forth the same knowledge of and relationship to the tradition it holds of us. Can the diaspora Jew today say that the Judaism which he practices is somehow an authentic and legitimate successor to the tradition. Authentically Jewish is the quality of Jewish life which we have in the diaspora somehow genuinely related to the Jewish past. So you see, Ahad Ha'am criticizes us as well. And his contribution to the question of modern Jewish identity is you must somehow be able, while being a modern man, to say that you are an inheritor, really, of the Jewish past. That while he has no objection to changing forms and expressing them, that somehow it must be the Jewish traditional spirit 
which is expressed and nothing else will really do. Now you may argue that you do this in religious terms, you may argue that it's done by the Israelis in the state of Israel, but the question remains. And Achar Ha'am, by focusing upon the question of Jewish identity and Jewish character and upon the, leg the Jewish legitimacy of the form of expression, has added another dimension to our understanding of the problem of what it means to be a Jew in modern times that we shall now be able to trace from here on to the end of the year. And now I shall stop for questions till the end of our session. Yes. Well, morals and ethics I was using to mean the same thing. Now, he says, what is, the, what is the key point of the prophetic message? What is really the important part about what the prophets say? Not that destruction is coming from Babylonia or you mustn't rely upon the Egyptians or the Assyrians are going to destroy you. The really important thing about their message is something new in world religion, namely, that there is an absolute standard of right and wrong. And if you do wrong, you are wrong. That you ought to do good. This is what it means to be a man and a human being. Now this, he says, is the key to the prophetic message. And I think he's right. I mean, it's very hard to argue with that, particularly when you see how the prophets were stressing this as against Jewish ritual. You know, Jeremiah says, you go to the temple and you say, well, we're good we're Jews. You see, we go to the temple all the time. Look. And Jeremiah says, you go up to Bethel and look at the temple, or Shiloh, go to Shiloh and look at the temple that was up there today, it's in ruins. The rain beats down upon it. And God will not hold back from destroying a temple too. And this temple will be destroyed if you behave the way you're behaving. Therefore, from the prophetic mind, and Isaiah says the same thing, why do you come into my courts and trample, and uh, when you lift up your hands to me, your hands are full of blood, wash you, make you clean, namely, do the good, hate evil, and the like. So that the prophets are clearly stressing as more important than uh, ritual and temple observance, morality. And to him, this is the high point of the Jewish tradition. Why? Because in a way, what occupies the Jewish tradition from the time of the rabbis on is law, Jewish law. Now, while much of the Jewish law is ritual law, and, you know, he sees that simply as a kind of a national insurance policy. Much of the rest of the law is a pursuit of justice. If one man rents his house to a second man, and the second man says he will guarantee to take the house on the understanding that if a ship comes in from India and brings him spices, he will be able to store the spices, and he stores the spices there, and it turns out that the house breaks down in the middle, but they weren't really spices to begin with, but it turned out that it was salt, this is a pursuit of justice, you see? And therefore, it is a moral fervor which lies behind this. And so from his point of view, this is the key to what it means to be a Jew and the Jewish people. And the Reformed Jews, by and large, agreed with him. Everybody was agreeing with him in those days because this was a, the age after Kant. And the whole key to religion was ethics. The whole key to understanding what it meant to be a man was that he was ethical. It was also before Freud. <laughs> yes? Wasn't Achad Ha'am therefore disrupting influence to hurt some of his followers in his day? Yes, he certainly was, just in the same way that Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel were in their day. And he believed that he could do, you know, really nothing better for the Jewish people than to be disruptive. You see, the, the question is, what are you being disruptive for? In other words, if people have the right impulses but are going in the wrong direction, you know, everybody's going to put, up, put out the fire, but they're going down to 90th Street when the fire is up at 94th Street. So to stop the crowd and say, don't go, is very useful. And that's what he thought he was doing. He was all wrong. What was he? The was the greatest thing that happened to Jews. In, in the last 2,000 years. And maybe the reason that Herzl is the greatest thing that happened to the Jews in 2,000 years was because Achad Ha'am was there, that when Herzl fell apart, the Jewish part was there to be taken up. 
You know, it's, it's a very interesting thing. What would Zionism have been if Herzl had lived? Supposing Herzl had gone on, let's say Herzl lived to be an old man, 60, another 10 years or so. Supposing Herzl lived for 10 years, and every year he walks into the Zionist Congress and says, now we can't let this out to the press, but I spoke to the Minister of the Interior of Bulgaria, and he said to me that he spoke to the Minister of the Treasury of Morocco, who has a cousin in the court. Do you follow me? Now that's just about the level upon which the Zionist movement was going on. And while for you know, five or six years, maybe eight or ten years, this can go on, the question is how long could it have gone on? Now, I don't know how long it could have gone on. For all I know, it could have gone on from 1896 to 1917 when the Balfour Declaration was issued. But while the Jews have a lot of patience to wait for the Messiah, 21 years to wait for Herzl to have produced something of a charter, you know, it's a little hard to believe. So I think that one of the reasons that Herzl is such a great man is that the Jews had enough seichel to follow him just so far and that Achad Ha'am was there with a lot of the seichel. Of course, if I may say so, the history is the Jewish people again because they also knew where not to follow Achad Ha'am. If it had been up to Achad Ha'am, there would practically be no colonists in Palestine. You know? And therefore, these rather practical, hard-headed people like Yusishkin and Weizmann and, and Ben-Gurion, who without real theories and without real philosophy, they went and they did and they talked and they lived and they dreamed, these are the real heroes. You know, in a way the Jewish people is really the hero of Jewish history as it should be, despite all the great men. Because when you think of the nonsense that they might have believed in, and didn't, it's remarkable. One is almost ready to believe Achad Ha'am's theory of the Jewish people having a unique soul of its own that made it possible to reject so much. Somebody once said that the Jews should write a, a history of what they didn't believe in, and that's what Abba Hillel Silver did when he tried to write that book, Why Judaism Differed, which is worthwhile reading uh, as a very interesting book expressing the best point of view of the 1930s. This is a crib from George Bernard Shaw. <laughs> Who did he say was the greatest mind of the 15th century? I've forgotten. <laughs> Another question? I'm being smart alecky and I could forgive me, I'm tired. Yes? There seems to be a dichotomization. This man, exactly as you said, he was a theorist. He certainly had the Jewish tradition and culture and heritage himself. Yeah. And he knew what he was talking about. And he spoke of, of a ethical passion, a prophetic people, a sense That's of morality. Right. And um, it seems to me, however, that the prophets were just a little bit more democratic than he was. They didn't try to say that you have to be so prepared culturally uh, to be a Zionist and only, only these people will, will, will go to heaven. I mean, he seems to be very almost uh, dogmatic and pedantic on that. And I feel, as you say, that if it were up to him, there would be very few colonists. Well, didn't he realize that he was, he was being perhaps a bit too idealistic? And didn't he give some clue to how these people who didn't have this culture or who didn't have the opportunities that he did, how they could be led gradually to this um, very ideal sense that you have, because after all, any teacher realizes, no matter how great their heritage, that it's impossible to get a heritage overnight. Yeah, well, I it's think he would. I think he would accept everything you had to say. He would simply say, "Let's start with a small handful who are ready first. We'll start for those. After all, there are other people with Jewish culture around, with knowledge of Judaism around. We'll start with them, and we will prepare them, and then they will go and prepare other people." And the other people will prepare other people. And, but don't rush. Don't rush this American business with numbers. You take everything that's being said today upon mass culture in America, everything about the way we refuse to deal with individuals, everything about our middle brow attitudes, you know? And that's a ha What's the rush? Instead of issuing seven million classical records in one year, to which people listen to while they're playing ping pong. Can you, can you, can you imagine such a 
For him, he would say, better that 700 people should listen to a classical record and really understand it than 7 million people should play bar talk during a cocktail party. <laughs> and as far as what you have to say about the prophets, uh, the prophets demanded a great deal in their own way. They demanded a complete turning. A complete turning. And uh, they weren't very patient by and large. They were absolutists. All that I can say about Acha Ha'am is that, you know, he wasn't a, a, well, what shall I say? He wasn't an organization man. <laughs> he really wasn't. There are some people who by style and life are aristocrats. He was an aristocrat, but an aristocrat of the spirit. And of the Jewish, certainly not a realist, doesn't want to be a realist, that's the trouble with the world. Too many realists. That's right, okay. Now I don't know, is it possible for a man to hold such a point of view when there isn't a Herzl around? I don't know, I think I have occasionally met such people, they don't give a... they don't. <laughs> Let the world go its own way, it's either right or nothing. Now most of us are Americans, we, this is too much, we'd rather slop it through somehow or another, you know? Get it done, even if it's done improperly. So as a result, much of the time it's done improperly. I am a bureaucrat uh, by profession, and my problem is to live under the pressures of bureaucracy. And what it means is there's no time to do anything properly. Nothing is done properly, and, and uh, as, uh, people on the outside might say, looks wonderful, it's marvelous. But we know what it is. It's, it's hamburger, and it should have been steak. Well, ladies and gentlemen, forgive me, I'm terribly sorry, but now I must be an aristocrat of the chronometer, and it is time for us to stop. Next week, we shall take up the hour. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.